Uh, thanks very much, Mark. Um, yeah, so as Mark said, uh, I'm going to focus on uh, the identification characters, primarily looking at the uh, the moth and the caterpillars, uh, which is probably what most people are going to be encountering in the field. Um, I'll start by going through the life cycle just to give a bit of an overview. Um, so eggs, of course, is what they begin as. There's a photo of uh, eggs uh, of the fall armyworm. Uh, they look a lot like many other moth eggs. Uh, they lay batches of about one to 200 eggs per batch with females uh, recorded as laying up to 2,000 uh, in their lifetime. The larvae uh, occur as six uh, instars or stages. Uh, they're just illustrated there. Uh, we have L1, L2, L3, 4, 5, and 6. So L just means larva. And there are approximate uh, sizes there as well. So bear in mind that those sizes are uh, contingent on how much food they've eaten. So they can, they can vary. But that just gives you a bit of an idea about the size of the grubs at the different stages. They go through to the pupil stage, uh, which is about 14 to 18 millimeters in length, uh, which form inside a cocoon structure. And they can be found underground in the ground up to about eight or so centimeters depth. And the moth itself is, there's a size there, wingspan, wingtip to wingtip is 32 to 40 millimeters. Uh, different individuals are different sizes. The moths themselves live for about one to three weeks and the total life cycle can vary um, from one to three months, uh, which is dependent on the season. So during the summertime, that will be quicker, of course. So I'm gonna focus on the identification of larvae and moths. Primarily because eggs and pupae in the field are highly problematic. They look like so many others and uh, really it's just through rearing or um, DNA identification is really what you'd need for those ones. So moving on to the larvae, first instar. Uh, they look very similar to many other first instar or uh, neonate larvae that emerge from eggs of the, this moth family or close relatives. So they're very problematic for infield identification. However, there are a few things that you can look for to give you a bit of an inkling that you may have fall army worms. So look for that kind of spotty appearance. But in addition to that, uh, the, 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 the very beginnings of a pink line down the side, each side of the body, I've highlighted it there. And developing white lines running what we call longitudinally down the body as well. Uh, again, if you want positive confirmation for this, really it's either through rearing or some DNA work. Uh, this just shows you a couple of other um, uh, caterpillars of different species, Helicoverpa or Spodoptera latura, uh, one of the species that occurs in Australia to show you how similar they look. Uh, if we move on to second and third instars, we see the development of those characters primarily through the uh, intensification of the pink banding down either side and a little bit more clearer those white lines that run up and down the body. And again, very, very spotty uh, body. Uh, the fourth and fifth instars are starting to resemble the final instar. Uh, so I'm going to save discussion of the characters uh, for, for that one in the next slide. But that's where you're really starting to see a difference between those early instars and they're looking like more like a classic uh, Frugiperda caterpillar. So here's the sixth and final instar. Uh, characteristics to look for are uh, head with what we call a reticulate pattern. So it's this mottle kind of uh, patchy uh, appearance on the head. Uh, the thoracic shield, so that's this it's like a collar just behind the head, is generally of a very similar color to the head. Not exact, it's, these things are quite variable in their, in their color. And the overall color itself can be quite variable from pinkish, yellowish, brownish to dark uh, to almost quite, quite black um, in appearance. So uh, that's, that's important to bear in mind, but they tend to have this granulose mottled appearance to them as well. They lack dark dorsal patches, and I'll show some of these in one of the close relatives in a later slide, but they have these lines running up and down the body, these sort of pale, alternating, relatively ill-defined uh, lines running up and down the body, which you see in the, those early instars as developing uh, more clearer in this later instar. Uh, if you've got uh, access to a microscope or a really good hand lens or you've got excellent eyes, 
you can look towards the very front of the body in the back where you'll see these uh, small ring-like what, what are called sclerotized. Sclerotized just means it's sort of a hardened part of the body around the CT here and here as you can see. So they're ring-like, so they're quite diagnostic. And something that's that's quite uh, pronounced is if you're looking, this is the tail end of the caterpillar, these uh, pinaculae or spots, these are enlarged on the abdominal segment 8 and they're in a square arrangement and on abdominal segment 9 they're in a trapezoidal arrangement. So you, if you draw a, sort of lines between those dots it's more like a trapezoid so that's quite and they're quite a little bit bigger than the other dots that are on the body. Bearing in mind that many other caterpillars also have dots as well. I'm just going to refer to a useful website uh, here, which you may like to have a look at. It's got pictures of many caterpillars. It's Australian caterpillars and butterflies and moths, so it does not include uh, fall armyworm. But it's got, if you want to become familiar with what different caterpillars and moths look like that occur in Australia, this is a pretty good place to go. And they do include six of the seven Spodoptera species that already occur in Australia, Exempta, Exigua, Litura, Mauritia, Picta, and Umbraculata. This is just a quick overview um, of those moths. The seventh one here, S. apertura, is not on that website, but I've just put a photo of a moth here which was sourced from the Barcode of Life database, as well as their geographic distribution by state based on records in the Australian Plant Pest database. So it gives you a bit of an idea of what the different species look like within that genus. Picta looks particularly different, as you can see. So moving on to the moth itself, uh, this is what uh, an adult moth looks like. Uh, they're variable in colour from greyish brown to rust brown. Males have a slightly more distinct colour pattern to them. They're generally smaller than other moths that have uh, the similar kind of bold wing patterns to them, so they're, they're, not, they're not large moths. And if you do have a moth in good condition, you can look for pale spots as circled here, very quite indistinct or what's been referred to as hourglass, a row of hourglass-shaped markings on the very edge of the forewing. And something else to notice is that they have very white hind wings with a narrow gray uh, brown band on the edge. Now bear in mind that there are other moth species that have very similar looking wings to this as well, especially the hind wing. If you're using pheromone traps, this is what your moths will probably look like. So uh, the, the wing patterning is, is essentially useless in this context. So, but however, the pheromone traps are strongly attractant to the males, and the males are very easy to identify based on a relatively straightforward genitalic dissection. So, if the male genitalia are removed, the entire body removed and soaked in 10% potassium hydroxide for a small period of time at a heated temperature, details could be provided uh, to those who are interested. And uh, some fairly basic dissection of this structure here, one of the valves is a very distinctive shape, which is unlike any other moth that you're going to come across that could potentially be Spodoptera frugiperda. A close, rel or a close relative of the same family, but different genus, is the false armyworm. This is being picked up as bycatch in the pheromone traps. This is easy to tell apart because it's slightly larger. It has a very fluffy tail. These CT here are, uh, are much bigger than, uh, are much um, uh, are bold than in the uh, false armyworm. The wing pattern, if you do have scales, is different. But importantly, if you do a dissection of the male genitalia, it is a very different shape to that of Frugiperda, as you can see here. The traps which have been coming to us for diagnostics have only had this other species present in the traps, and this species is known from Australia, or Queensland at the very least. If we want to look at other caterpillars, here is an example of uh, close relatives, Spodoptera latura, and these are the black marks here that I was referring to, which are absent in the fall armyworm. We're getting a lot of these submitted. Helicoverpa, of course, we're getting these submitted as suspect fall armyworms. These are different based on overall pattern and coloration and also seedle arrangement. So those ones we should be quite familiar. And this one here is the false armyworm similar, um, but it lacks the diagnostic characters which are present um, as a group in the Frugiperda, as I've described previously. I would like to just refer to also the Queensland Government website here. I think there's going to be another link to this at the end, but this provides some information about commonly encountered army worms and cut worms uh, of different genera as well. 
Uh, nearly finished. Uh, I just want to finish uh, almost on the slide, uh, second to last slide, molecular DNA diagnostics. For those of you who are interested, it's possible. There is sequence analysis. You can do mitochondrial DNA sequence analysis or indeed nuclear DNA sequence analysis. There's uh, markers out there. Uh, the CO1 barcode region is fine. That's the slowest method to get a result depending on your access to sequencing facilities and molecular labs. Real-time PCR, which is described in the EPPO standard, uh, which I'll give a link to at the end, um, is much quicker, but it must be done uh, in a laboratory, as must the uh, sequence analysis. Uh, LAMP, which is a very, very fast method, which has infield capability, is not has not been uh, developed for this species as far as I am aware. Uh, useful resources, there are many. Uh, the EPPO Diagnostic Standard, which is where I got many of the photos for this presentation, is a good go-to place. Bear in mind it has different species, but it does not have the Australian ones, but it has excellent images. Uh, and reference to those molecular tests, the real-time PCR. There's lots of extension fact sheets out there because this is a worldwide pest. The Americans have produced lots of uh, different extension fact sheets. This is just an example from the University of Florida. And if you want to get into more details, you can go to the, uh, the primary scientific literature, such as this excellent 2002 world revision of the entire genus of Spodoptera containing all 30 species, which includes images of dissections of the genitalia as well as of the moths and lots of extra information should you need it.